Welcome to the Sustainability Nugget Podcast. I am Rara Sue Maraivi. And I'm Tosin Falorosho. On this podcast, we learn about sustainability by discussing various related topics while focusing on three pillars, the economy, the society, and the environment. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Sustainability Nugget. Today, I have a very awesome guest with me. All my guests are awesome, but <laughs> um, I'm just a fan of Bonnie because I think she's she's great. She has awesome experience in corporate sustainability. Um, and OK, let me officially introduce her. So Bonnie, my guest today is Bonnie Nixon, and um, she has held many high profile positions at um, the global forefront of new low carbon resource protected and just economy and um today she's the director of sustainability at long at the long beach container terminal which is the greenest and cleanest marine terminal in the world and you get to know more details about what makes it the cleanest and greenest um but he is a lifelong learner dedicated to global education digital digitization and the use of new and emerging technologies to help accelerate sustainability and advance human rights. Um, she obtained a bachelor's from Penn State in sociology and a master's degree in learning technologies. And she's currently completing a PhD <laughs> at the Pepperdine University in global leadership and change. Um, and her thesis explores the intersection of environmental injustice and modern slavery in complex supply chains. She also <laughs> teaches sustainable supply chain at Harvard and DCA Extensions. Hi, Bonnie. Welcome to Sustainable Nuggets podcast. Hi. Thank you so much, Tosin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Definitely. So can you um, share, let's start with your story. How did you get here? Where did you start from? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you. Thank you for that nice introduction, and you you pretty much covered everything that I'm doing um, right now, and uh, and it's been definitely a journey. And I would have to, if I if I start um, with the beginning, you know, I really originally got interested in sustainability when I was at college. So um, I I grew up in the New York, New Jersey area, in pretty much an urban area, and it was really for me every time I went outside and and went up to the mountains or went down the Jersey Shore or went to a lake, I just could feel like I could breathe and right. out of the city. And I just was like, ah, oh, I always felt like nature was home to me. And so that's how I felt all through my childhood. And then I went to I was going to uh, be a lawyer. I wanted to be a lawyer in social justice and for poverty issues and things and and fairness and and you know uh, that's really what I thought I would do. And when I went to Penn State, I was pre law. But while I was at Penn State, Three Mile Island happened, which was a nuclear power plant leak, mm -hmm. and that was very scary. And I was involved in. Um, student government and I got to just hear some of the dialogue between you know the power plant and the media and the administration we at Penn State were going to actually be one of the facilities where um, if the immune compromised or women and children you know might come and use our mm. auditoriums and our cafeterias and our facilities and so for me that was a really scary thing I was like well how have we done this to ourselves and why mm. Why are we in this place? And are is is nuclear power the right way to energize um, our utilities if if it's going to be this dangerous? And so I started to just do my own research on that, and that's what originally really got me involved. I I ended up going to school some in England and then moving to Amsterdam, where I studied green plans, and mm. um, and that was a Really, um, in the Netherlands, you know, they had really the the foresight to think about how do you look at the interdependency of utilities and business and 
and citizens. And so they brought all of those together and they were at the time putting many pieces of legislation together. And here in the United States, we were having a really hard time just getting one law passed like the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act. And Mm -hmm. so I, I wanted to understand, you know, what, what did they do differently? And, and, um, and that's kind of, you know, what were, were some of my initial motivations. And that brought me eventually to Boston, where I worked on the Boston Harbor Cleanup Project, mm-hmm. um, which was water and wastewater. And it was a $6 billion project. And I got to be sort of the head of PR for that. And then moved to San Francisco. I started an environmental planning and communications consultancy. Mm-hmm. We, grew that, we grew that to about 65 people um, with offices in San Francisco, Sacramento, and Washington, D.C. And I worked on a lot of infrastructure, water, waste, water, transportation, solid waste, utility. And if I may ask, what year was this? So this start, I started that in 1988. Um, that was one year between, before the Loma Prieta earthquake in San Francisco. And um, mm. and then I did that. Um, I had that position in that company until 2004. Um, there was actually some overlap. Um, and in that I had, we had offices, like I said, also in D.C. So we worked mm. on like, you know, uh, railroad projects and all over the country and DOE projects and transfer you know just many different kinds and but um that was the period of time that a a vice president from Hewlett Packard asked me to come and help design their supply chain social and environmental responsibility program and to be honest um I initially said no I'm I'm not interested I only work for the public sector Mm -hmm. I want to work on like common common good things and and right I was concerned that the private sector was, you know, not was only out for the profit and yeah, right. and, and not going to be good for for the public um, utilities and things like that. And so so I initially said no. And he was very persuasive. And, and I ended up going there. And so for about six years, I was actually owning my company and working my company in the public sector but also designing the whole program for Hewlett Packard. They didn't have a program at that time. And so I was designing it and, and um, yeah. So I and I'm sure many companies didn't have programs like that either. It's <laughs> now that sustainability exactly. and, you know, corporate social responsibility is mainstream, right? Yeah. So that was, so I did HP for thir- 13 years I spent there. I loved the company and I loved the opportunity and I still do today. Mm-hmm. Then I got a really cool opportunity with Walmart, and I did that um, to work in life cycle assessments and and really design to to look at like what are the most sold projects in Walmart, and mm-hmm. how could we provide guidance to all of their main supply chain and suppliers on doing things differently, and um, was there. And then I joined Mattel Toys. Mm-hmm. And- and that's what brought me to Southern California. And I've been here ever since doing a lot of the things that that you shared in the beginning in my um, bio. I went back to school and and um, and so now I've been working at the Port of Long Beach. Awesome. So I'm curious about what made you go back to school after all of that experience and all of those years of work that you've put in? It's a, that's a really great question because, um, I mean, I've always thought that I would continue on and do a master's and and a PhD. I I just, I love learning. I just love being in the learning environment. Mm. I've always been in workshops and and getting more skills and getting degree, you know, certificates in conflict resolution and mediation and arbitration and all of these things. But but one of the main reasons I went back was that as I was going around the world in supply chain, like fa- in factories and farms and fields mm-hmm. and forests and mines and 
and chem plants and refineries. I was going to all these places that are in 50 countries or so. And, and I was seeing how the, the workers, you know, were being treated or the environment was or wasn't being taken care of or the health mm -hmm. wasn't being protected. Yeah. But I, what I noticed was that when I would ask people, like, would you do this or can that frequently they'd be chasing after me and going, well, would you help or do you have a training or would you stay or can you send us stuff or can you mm. send someone here or is there a program that you would guide us to or can we go take a course in this? I, I was getting that pull all the time. And what, mm. what became more and more evident to me, it wasn't like people, I, I, I was having a feeling like people don't want to wake up in the morning and go, let's pollute and let's exploit people and let's pollute the environment. They just don't know a different way or a better way. And they're, they're, they too are sort of searching. I think when, I actually think that when the urge, when the basic survival instincts are met, like when people have safety and they have food and they have shelter, sure. I have the urge to grow and to learn is very strong. And I found that to be the case around the world. And then I started to think, you know, this is all about capacity building and capability building. And how can I get more skills in that? And how can I learn how to do it in a, in a more engaging and fun and participatory way and, right. and bring people along? So I... So I went back to school specifically to st study how to use learning technologies, you know, to engage people more. And I found that really interesting because you are um, combining uh, technology and you have listened to you talk many times, which I love to do, just, just listening to you experience your perspective on supply chain, I think is, you know, it's, it's not, people don't really get to see the back end. Um, when you purchase the furniture or the clothes or the um, the computer, you never really know like where all of those parts came from and what work went into making those things. Um, but also just the fact that you, the learning technology, like I've, I've seen you being so, being so enthusiastic about, you know, technological innovations, but also trying to connect people with it, like ensuring that the people factor is missing. I think, yeah, for me, that's really, really interesting and impressive. Um, to know that he actually, you know, took time out to study that. Well, one, I mean, one of the things I observed, Tosin, was that I remembered when I was in factories, specifically like in China or Malaysia and Indonesia, and I would watch. Mm. I, I would watch when they would get an hour. They were they get a lunch time or they get off of work, mm. and I'd see them immediately, you know, getting on their phone and. And I'd be, and a lot of times I would go over or I would ask them, or I'd even interview people and say, if you have a day off or you have a half a day off, or you have a, you know, what what do you do? And 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 they would show me on their phone how they either shop on their phone or they would play games. And in particular, like even the young women, they'd be sort of in these anime types of gaming things, mm. or men would be in in gaming. And and I always loved gaming myself I'll be honest there was a short time that that I worked even in a video company and I would game um and I grew up with like two brothers and and I could never you know I could never beat them in anything but I often but in anything physical like you know, right wrestling and softball and baseball and basketball you know and all these things I couldn't but I could mm -hmm. beat them games you know oh, would, that's cool I, I would play like air hockey and foosball and all of these different games and I would and and I would have fun on it and and I I mean it wasn't even so much that I always wanted to win I just wanted to play right and right. I and I thought you know I need to understand if that's where people are going to be there are three billion people today gaming on the planet Three billion people. So if there are that many people gaming, I'm like, I need to go there. And I, I remember that mentality from even when I was working on like a a freeway project in Richmond, mm. um, California. And and I was working with um, you know, disadvantaged communities and poor communities. 
And people would go, oh, we're going to do a public meeting. And I think people aren't going to show up at a public. I mean, we need to go to the church and give away a turkey and and talk to people, you know, and, or we need to like the, we need to go on the radio to what they listen to Mm -hmm. or we go to their community center or their market and don't ask them to come to you. Exactly. We need to go to the, and I felt that with this gaming thing and I thought, okay, I, so I started to really study gamification theory and I thought, this makes total sense. It's rewards, it's present time, mm-hmm. interactive, it's cooperation versus competition. And, and then I started to get really interested in like AI and virtual reality and augmented reality and robotics. And because I could just see that we could use all of these things to... Um, we could really use these things to engage people. And I started mm-hmm. to really go after that. That's mm-hmm. awesome. You remind me of um, my my research advisor when, when I was getting my master's degree. So he got us to get used to um, Roblox and Sims. And he would say, okay, so imagine um, instead of the doom <laughs> and gloom that we, it looks like we are facing currently, try to imagine what you, what you think a sustainable world means to you and go into sims and do that and i didn't really pay attention to it i was more in, into video editing and creative stuff fashion <laughs> but i could i i saw how the approach with me and my other classmates really got into it and someone actually viewed the whole house she added people to it a whole city actually she added people to you know just getting people to get creative um within the space that they find comfortable like pe- some people f- just as you said, like you're having fun playing a game, but you're also solving problems. And while you might feel like, oh, it's all virtual, there's actually learning and thinking and reflection going on while you're doing those things. Yeah, well, and also you think about it in AI, you know, we use that in, immensely to um, in AI to, uh, you know, to be able to provide more transparency and provide, um, you know, do deep data research and figure out like what, you know, with more, I mean, I've always believed that we're going to change things once we're aware of them, right? And if we're not aware, so why not use some of these tools for greater transparency? And so Mm -hmm. that's um, one of my real goals is just how to make this, how to wake up, get more transparent about this, but also get people engaged, get them participating. Um, and if, and if that means making it fun, then mm-hmm. we should, I mean, I don't actually think that you have to work has to always be horrible and tedious and, and right. negative labor, but you know, that's part of why I work on things like modern slavery, because I've been around the world and I see, the level of exploitation that's occurring. And that's, that's sad and unfortunate to me. Yeah. Um, so going um, back to the, just your experience in supply chain and um, the various companies that you've worked with, how, how are you able to effectively lead change in those companies? Um, did you implement policies? Did you um, create a green team? What did you do to, you know, get the conversation started? You know, I think if you walk in a room or with any group of people and you say, I want to change things, the initial reflex is to push away, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Not generally really comfortable with change. To do it, I think, gracefully, and you have to do it in a way that they feel they can they can be part of it and i i think that that that's true of any sort of really solid change management program is 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 acknowledging and listening to the way they do it now and then going is there something i can do to build on this so i remembered when i started the supply chain program in hp what i did was i said look I can't imagine that how we do supply chain around the world is going to be similar to in Brazil, 
versus Mexico versus Eastern Europe versus India versus Africa versus Southeast Asia versus China. Like the, it's all going to be different in Eastern Europe. And so I went around the world and I would spend time with the procurement people. And I did this thing called a day in the life of a procurement person. And just mm-hmm. to look at in Brazil or in Eastern Europe and and I saw the systems and tools they used and what they had built. And I embraced those and ex- accepted those and said, okay, how can I build on top of that? So mm-hmm. that I'm not just making your job more difficult. I'm right. an element to your job. And so let's look at, and can I help train you in this? And can you train me in this so that I can do a better job for you? And so, mm-hmm. so that's really the the way I started the program. And then I recognized that in most really good, solid business management programs, like we have things called like ISO, the International Standards Organization, or solid management systems, or like lean lean Mm -hmm. manufacturing, or Six Sigma. Like these are all programs that that are based on root cause systems thinking where you're actually stopping and going, okay, what are the targets and metrics? Who's in charge? How do we measure this? What do we do in the case of a problem? Um, What is, you know, our, our timeframe for this? And, and, and it's just a very systematic, solid way of thinking through things. So I believe that you start with a set of standards, goals, rules um, that you set, and then you monitor them, and then you verify them, and then you report and or disclose on them. And you and then you have capacity building or capability building, you know, or learning as foundational for all of those things. And when you do that well and right. It's not a linear process. You don't like have a standard, then you monitor, then you verify. It, it, you do that, but then what you find is whatever you learn from the verification or you learn from the reporting, you bring back in and you go, okay, how do we change the standard now? Right. How do we monitor in a more, in, how do we bring due diligence in in a way that's a little bit different? And so, so I think that's for that, the, you know, that's what's really positive is that you can, um, you, you can think of it more spherically than linear. Like from a procurement officer, you know, what keeps my mind was, do you have records of that? Can that be like a series? <laughs> mm-hmm. And you'd offer as templates, you know, for people to, um, I guess people, especially that are in supply chain, um, to be able to, something to refer back to and learn from, especially yeah. If, yeah, if you're dealing with global supply chain management. Yeah, That's, and I, yeah, yeah. I find that interesting. I mean, yeah. I do. You know, I, have, I have embedded a lot of that into my courses at at UCLA and Harvard, and as I teach supply chain or or I lecture on it, I've embedded that thinking because it was that thinking that enabled me to build what we called a supplier engagement model, and um, and that model was I, I still, I mean, to this day, I mean, I'm trying to think of when I cre- created that initially it was um with a colleague of mine from microsoft i was with hewlett packard and she was from microsoft and she knew this tool called visio and i had this the strategic you know fa- foundation from having done this for a couple of years yeah. in my mind and she just sort of interviewed me and i said okay the first thing you do is you got to do a risk assessment and you do um and you really have to do a risk assessment like four times during the process. You want to do it in the beginning to determine what is my what's the population I'm going to focus on. Then you want to do it once you've given them a questionnaire and introduced them to the program and to the code of conduct and to the scope to determine whether they get it and or they're vulnerable for different reasons. Like, i.e., if you've asked them how many how many formal employees do they have versus contract workers? That's like a big deal because if they're contract workers, they're probably, they're not paying them the same. They don't have the benefits. They're probably, they're more vulnerable. They're likely traveling from one location to another. They're migrating. That's one of the root cause issues 
you know, migration. Yeah. So you you're so that so that moves you to the next phase where and then you may monitor them and walk through this whole questionnaire process with them and see who's in charge. And it's at that point, you want to assess their risk again, because now you determine, are they really committed? Do they have the right people working on this? You know, is, uh, do they need training? Do they say yes on this question and no on this question, which shows this huge gap, you know, is, and, and so that's the third level. And then you want to come back in at the end and say, you know what, I've given them all these opportunities and all these mm-hmm. tools, but they're still not getting it. So I'm going to have to maybe let them go. I might have to cut this relationship. And so I think that's, um, but, but you have training all throughout and you have auditing and monitoring and, and verification and you, and you ask them to report as well. Mm -hmm. So, so I think there's a lot of opportunities, um, you know, for, for this, for, for supplier engagement, for, education for right. due diligence monitoring for risk assessment tools and so so that's that I, we created from having done this day in the life of the procurement you know oh, that's awesome yeah. yeah and and now it would be day in the life of a supply chain professional because we call procurement people supply chain now you know right I really <laughs> emphasized and focused on that but I should say that, you know, I really do understand the broader space of, remember, you asked me where how my career started. We didn't call it sustainability. We didn't, and we called it environmental protection. And we were protecting the air, water, you know, the, um, the land. Right. We were to making sure people were healthy, you know, their health and their safety were protected. And then... We were looking at labor practices, like the basic HR types of things, right? And then, so that that for years went on, and then we started to call it sustainability. And then now you're starting to see this evolution into ESG, ESG, yeah. governance and regeneration. And that's not to say that sustainability, you know, and regeneration are the same thing. I do understand and, and and appreciate the nuanced differences. But at the end of the day, Tosin, it's like we are still just trying to protect our environment and not exploit our people. You know? yeah. I, I think that's what it goes back to. You remember the three the three pillars, the people, the society and the environment, sorry, the profit, the people and the environment, but more so the people and the environment should come before the profit. Yeah, that's what that's the thing I, I to be honest, I'm, I'm always I do with the work I do today, I, I emphasize the fact that I'm working at a place where the economy and the environment can thrive together. And I and I do recognize the importance of um, of solid business. But I, I will be honest that I, I I think that we have really taken the profit orientation and motive out of um yeah you know we're we're so deeply committed to that part that we're 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 over the top in what I could what I would probably describe as the need for greed you know (laughs) right and I think that it it now has been ingrained into that's a mindset that you find in every sector when you go to business school or I was having a conversation with a fashion student one day and she said the concept now is to they are, you're trained to produce to mass produ- for mass production for growth and growth and growth upon growth. And she's like, I'm not cut out for this. I don't think I want to be in this space. Like I know, I know what I want the, you know, the small fashion business where it doesn't mean it's not successful. It doesn't mean that you're not making an impact. But um yeah, just this drive, constant, consistent push for more and more and more <laughs> profits, results, unchecked, metrics, you know. Unchecked growth. I mean, the truth is right. the, the land just like, you know, has the planet has a finite amount of resources. And I don't think we've been willing to just accept that. We think that we can do growth at any um, at any price. And it's just the pl- that's just not true. And um, there really are only four things happening 
here on the planet, if you think about it, that we have to address. And the first is emissions, emissions out into the air, you know, from the fossil fuel and man-made activities, petrochemical activities, insecticides, all of Mm -hmm. these things. So, so that's the, the emissions. And if you think of the planet like an egg, it's just the shell of the egg that's cracked and there's holes in. And it's like, so as a result, things going out, things are coming in, more sun, you know, yeah. intense sun coming in. The second is uh, is the bioaccumulation of non-biodegradable matter, right? It's that, it's the rubber, it's the plastics, yeah. it's the um, concrete it's the things that just don't break down. Mm-hmm. You know, the third is the um the the mining, drilling, fracking, uh dredging into the core of the earth. You know, I mean, just like a human body, and that's what the planet is, it's one system. If we were to put knitting needles and st- inside and just keep poking and poking and screwing, it's like all the blood would start coming out, right? right. <laughs> Our equilibrium would get lost, our balance. And we wonder, why are we having all these earthquakes and tornadoes and more hurricanes? And more? And like, we're, you know, we're tilting the, you know, we're testing its equilibrium on all levels. Yeah. We're taking the oil out of the center of it. It's lubricant, just like we would in a body. And, and then the fourth is we're really affecting the only naturally regenerative process on the planet there is. And that's um, photosynthesis by mm-hmm. deforestation, by taking yeah. the trees that provide the oxygen. So it's it's these four activities. If we were to minimize, reduce, eliminate, you know, change the way we do these four things, we actually could have a more a self sustaining place. That you know, and quite frankly. Like the the planet isn't very emotional about all this. It's like it'll put you know it'll probably just like go. Okay, I'm gonna I'm about to flick you people off like a flea on a dog because I've had enough, and you know you're not treating me well, and you've tested me beyond all limits, and now I'm just gonna turn back into a ba- gaseous ball of fire like I started, and the pro you know, and you just won't be here, you know, so. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, it's like we're really affecting our own ability to, you know, to live and love and play on this incredibly cherished planet that we have and these gifts we have. I mean, for those of us who have traveled around and seen the amazingly beautiful treasures um, on every continent and met some of the most amazing people, you know, and... I think it's just sad. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just sad that we're taking such advantage of its of its gifts. Yeah, and I th- I think that's where uh, that's why the concept of regeneration is being pushed because it's really going back to uh, there's a word I like biomimicry because it's really going back to to study how the earth is able to sustain itself. Like nothing exactly leaves forever especially when you study plants or animals living things like they die and then it's not like they are the body's there just they're rotting and it rots but then it goes back to the earth and then it grows into something so there's always that circular that you know consistent cycle that goes on which i think is the problem that um we have with I, I believe you can do business and still be sustainable, but it's just when you're not looking into the full picture, it's you're just when you're only concerned about making products and then selling them and then nothing else. Like you don't care about the yeah. um, by, by product or anything. That's that's where problem is. And you know, that brings me to my next question, which is um for startups or you know, there's a difference between companies that have just done business as usual and are trying to change. But there are also those that are going into, you know, setting up new businesses. There will always be new innovations. How can they imp- implement sustainability or regeneration or secularity into their model from the onset? You know, uh, I think 
startups are the place where that is occurring from the outset. I mean, if you go back to, you, you know, when I was working for Walmart, we looked at like, what are the products they sold the most of? Okay. And then we really were aggregating and looking at detailed life cycle assessments, LCAs, where you're, um, I mean, what is an LCA? It's where you sort of really define, you know, what is the the unit? So, you know, if it's this pair of glasses or it's mm-hmm. this cell phone is, you know, the unit. And then you you say, okay, you know, what is the um, project, ba- what is the product boundaries? Am I going to look from this part to this part? And then you, you know, really do a life cycle inventory where you're, you know, image, what are your inputs? What are your outputs? And then you do a deep level, you know, assessment on that. So that outcomes your life cycle impacts, right? Yeah. And we were doing all of that work and, and looked at things like the cleaning products, like detergent and surface cleaner were two of the most highly sold things, orange juice and wheat mm-hmm. cereal and, you know, and laptops or cell phones were, were another one. And I think um trying to think of a uh, strawberry yogurt was one that we looked at. Interesting. Yeah, but but, at least strawberry. (laughs) Yeah, like what they sold the most of, interestingly enough. And and I remembered when we were doing the cleaning products, you know, you really, and this is what you find in when you really study supply chain, is there's only a few companies that kind of control the marketplace. And so you take um cleaning products or detergents and surface cleaners, and it's Unilever, Procter and Gamble, and Dial Hankel. You know, they probably own, you know, 80, 90 percent of the marketplace. But right. then you're saying, OK, and they all do things pretty similarly. You know, here's the way they, you know, are trying to change and they're being forced and asked to do things more sustainably. So how do they do that? Well, what we did was we looked at like method and seventh generation over here that at that time were startups. We're startups, yeah. We're startups, and they were saying, look. I remembered Adam, the CEO of um, of uh, Method, and he's like, I'm going to make it so that you can drink these products. You know, he's like, because that's what you could do when my grandmother, you know, made like clean the windows with lemon juice and vinegar. And, right. you know, and that's what's in these products. And why have we gone so far away from that to all these chemicals? You know, and that was his concept. And in seventh gen, at one point, um, they were looking at, well, how do you make the the container compostable? Does it need to be this? How do you recycle this? And 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 so and, and even like looking at does do you have to use what's the components inside the spray nozzle? Does that have to be this? Oh yeah, you know, and all of these things. And and then so it was like that we could hold those startups up to Unilever and uh, Henkel and. Procter and Gamble and say, can't you do this like this too? You know, and can't you do it? You already have the resources and the, you know, if you do it like this, we'll incentivize you. We'll buy more. We'll put your product in a better place in on the shelf or we'll, you know, do specials on it. And, and I think so, so to me, like we, I think we have to face that, you know, as much as like the startups, like they come into the, they come into the place to push innovation and to mm. push creativity. And, and you you were absolutely right. Pointing out like biomimicry, that's Janine Benneris. And, um, and, but, and because companies that can, you know, take the time, put some research into looking at, how could I design this thing differently? How can I do it like nature would do it? An example that she she once talked about and remembered was like fans. If you look at fans, they're designed with these sort of flat things to go up. And, and quite frankly, if there's heat that's rising and you're trying to cool the area, sometimes with that design, you're pushing the heat back down. Yeah. <laughs> You're not, if, you're not <laughs> yes, so. I, I can attest to that. I live in the northern part of Nigeria and it gets really hot yeah. and it just gets to a t- point where the fan you turn on is actually, you notice you're circulating the same here, which is just 
hot here at this point. Hot? So, yeah. <laughs> For so what, she, what they did was they started studying like flat. They started studying aspects of nature, and they were looking at flowers. How do they get the ventilation in? to them you know to grow and and they use the calla lily i don't know if you remember the calla lily is like that white spiral flower that we often see at easter and, and different things it's a beautiful flower mm. and, and they and it's a spiral inside and they and they tried to they designed like some of the industrial fans in that shape oh, that too. and i remembered listening to this gentleman saying they were 68 percent more efficient you know, or they looked at the silkworm that creates this kind of glue that's much stronger than anything we can create in glue mm. chemicals. And, and so, and it's, that's not to say, oh, let's like create a million silkworms, but we can replicate, <laughs> yeah. replicate that process and look at the way they thought. And, and each one of these frameworks has something to offer, like Cradle to Cradle, Bill McDonnell and Michael Brumgarten, they were saying, look, you maybe can't take one product and always put it back into itself. Like we were able to do that at HP with inkjet cartridges, like take the inkjet cartridge, chop it all yeah. up, and put it back in. But we still needed to bring in some virgin materials. And, and I think that if one thinks through that model in its entirety, they would recognize the best cradle to cradle would be put a bunch of companies together. And my waste can be your raw material. And and I very much agree with what you said. And like, when you look to nature, there is no waste. Like I just came back from Africa and I'm watching, you know, the elephants in the Cape Buffaloes with the bird on its back that picks off the mites or, you know, my favorite was the dung beetle because here's this beetle that you have met, you have the, the manure, or the weight or the um the poop from the elephant yeah. or the rhinoceros that's sitting there in this big clump and that creates methane right methane gas we know that from the cow mm -hmm. out in the fields mm -hmm. well the dung beetle goes over there and it and it grabs a bunch of that dung and it starts rolling it and it rolls it all the way up hills and all of that and 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 the female, the male is rolling it with his back legs, not even his front legs. He's rolling it backwards. And the female stays on and she injects her larvae into the middle of this ball of dung. And, and then she, and then they get, make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And she stays on while the larvae is in there and it's, um, and it's hatching. And then they find a place for it. So now mm -hmm. guess what? The dung beetle has separated all that dung because there's hundreds of them, millions of them. Yeah. And they've separated it out. So now there's no more methane coming yeah, out. Yeah. That potent thing is right. That was like the atmosphere. And, the, and guess what? That like little baby dung beetle starts to eat the dung and that's its food too. It's larvae. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, the whole thing is so elegant and you look and go, why can't we do that? There's no, exactly. yeah, it. it's, that's, that's my mantra. When, when I remember when I got into grad school and I would tell my professor, one of my first assignments, I told him my mantra is there's nothing is waste. We just haven't found a use for it. And then I also think it's a cultural thing because where I, come from um you mentioned africa but like specific like different african countries just have a way of ensuring that we keep things in circulation so even with the fact that i mean things might be a little bit different now because we're trying to be westernized the goods but you know in the past i knew even when in pl plastic was introduced we don't just throw them away so when you finish drinking a bottle of water for example we'd have people would pick up those plastic bottles and um, we have locally produced drinks that they would, you know, use those plastics for. Or um, with cassava production, for example, when cassava is processed, the peel is taken off. And then my, my so my, using my also as an example, my dad had a sheep farm. So he used to raise sheep and goat. And we, people who produced cassava would actually bring the pills to us like we had bags of free food and then there was a whole market for that like when those people didn't have stuff we could go to the market and buy cassava pills and that was the animal feed so we did <laughs> which is they're also eating natural rich starch 
start yes. changing it. So it's. No, I remember that, Akasava. And I think that, you know, but I do actually think that what happened here, and I wish I knew the, like, the genesis and the exact time frame when, you know, we began mm. creating things from petroleum and in particular, like the plastics and these, the, and these, things that we do use and we seem to be so dependent on and need. But I ask myself, you know, consistently, like, is, you know, this much plastic is just, it's, it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's, it hasn't been good for us. And yet, no. like when I listen to Michael and, and, and Bill, one thing they do talk about and they say like, we wouldn't have a problem if we kept the bios like the biosphere is here and the technosphere is here and we just didn't put them together we didn't like if we had to, we felt we need to have these plastic things or these you mm-hmm. know that we keep them in there and we don't let them touch we don't pour them into the environment we don't oh, yeah. the environment and and i think you know that's what's good about some of these frameworks another framework that is powerful is um well certainly circularity and um, and the concept of, that we're talking about where things can, you know, be be made into each other. But but yeah. the other one is natural capitalism. And that was um that was Amory and Hunter Lovins and Paul Hawken, who's now done drawdown, which mm-hmm. is also another framework. And so yes. I, when I teach of this, I really do make sure that we take a look at like I've already talked to you about those four things that happen on the planet. That's the natural right. framework that was out of Sweden. So you've got the natural step, you've got biomimicry, you've got natural capitalism, which says, look, we forget the fact that nature is providing us with all these services. And we don't, we ha- we have not put values on that. And we need mm-hmm. to be considering the value of values. And, and we need to be recognizing that the forest provides a filtration for water and, you know, for, and, and there are services, ecosystem services being provided, right. put a value on air and on water and on land and, and a really high value and not just think that it can be something you know, to dove or something to take from. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I think all of these frameworks are, are so valuable, but I do want to just make sure I went back to your earlier question on startups. Yeah. I mean, without innovation and without creativity, you know, that's what's so brilliant about, you know, the mind and mankind's ability or what a man and womankind's ability to, to, to solution find. So, you know, I, I like that word better than problem solve because it's, it's, yes, there are huge problems, but let's get in the mode of like, finding solutions of, of using that creativity to, to know that we are ingenious and we are, you know, able to come up with incredible um, solutions and ways to address, you know, what we maybe didn't know before. Like I think about, MTBE was was an additive that we came out and said, oh, this is going to be really great for, you know, gasoline. It's going to be a good thing. But then we were like, wait, we, we it, it polluted the entire groundwater basin. So there's this thing called like, what do we call it? it? To be- Unintended consequences. This right. Is- yeah. You know, we make one thing and we make a bigger think, problem. Right. You, you think you're solving that. a problem, but then it yeah, <laughs> creates externalities. To, yeah, you made a bigger problem. And, and you know, there were t- there was a time where we used to say, hey, you've got chemicals, put them in a drum and put them underground or bring them out into the ocean. And then it's like, oh, no, that was not a good idea. <laughs> you know, we just contaminated the entire groundwater basin and all the soil we just contaminated. We've got that right here in Southern California out by Catalina, you know, when DDT was found to be right. you know, interesting chemical, they said, Oh, put it in drums and bring it out in the ocean. And then they brought it out there. And then when they dropped the drum in, it wouldn't sink. So then they hit it with an ax so it sinks. So now you have all this incredible content and you've got the seals and the whales and the dolphins and oh, the amount of DDT in their, in their body. 
and their system and their blubber, it's just like, whoa, what were we thinking? You know, that was not a yeah, good like, <laughs> I, I think something to, you know, when I think about compostable single-use items, for example, that's something when you think about innovation and even sustainable products, it's important to really going back to life cycle analysis, what's going to be the end of this product. Let's not just make a product and say, oh, this is a solution because when you give people compostable items, like, oh yeah, finally we can make a sustainable choice. I'm like, well, first of all, <laughs> these materials require special composting facilities to break them down, which are not readily available. There's like a handful of those facilities currently in the US. And so it goes to landfill. Most of the waste haulers put it in landfill. So it's not a solution in the end. It's compostable. It sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> not. And 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 I do think that people we need to focus on how to compost and recognize that every food scrap and food thing does needs to, can actually be put in our green bin. Or if we are so motivated to compost, it will make our soil better. It makes it better. Right. And so I think that we have somehow been trained to be this throwaway society and even the waste management of the world and the and the landfill companies, they're like, yeah, it's cheaper to just dig a hole and put it in there. But yep. that is not. It's not. Because I think it's cheap. We keep our short sightedness keeps us focused. <laughs> short sightedness. Yeah, it's, and this is like I'm putting everybody, in, not just like people. Um, it, it makes us focus on the money. But it's like, yeah, it's cheap to put it in the landfill. But um, that's why I love Catherine Hale's book about saving us. We're actually saving ourselves in the end because when uh, millions of people get affected by the methane and other toxic chemicals leaking into the groundwater, it it's long term, right? But anymore, then but now, you start now paying look at all the healthcare yes. costs. Look at all of the hospital. Look right. at the- so is it really cheap in the end? I don't think so. No, I think that's what's so exciting about the evolution of ESG because. I think what what ESG really represents is for a long time, you know, if you think about this, I've been doing this since like Penn State happened in 1979. So, well, that's, that's before I dreamed of you. Yeah, so that's 43 <laughs> years I've been thinking about these things. Um, and and but for uh, like when I got to the private sector and HP and inside corporations, I I I knew from the outset, I said, if we don't get the CFO and the and the bookkeepers and the financial um, sector and the accountants and the risk management people involved in this conversation, we're not going to get the investment we need. We're not going to recognize that it's going to take a bit of an investment like you and to think long term and to think about unintended consequences and to think about you know, what ultimately will cost us. And I knew, you know, we, and many of us would talk about that. And we're like, how do we get Wall Street? And how do we get the financial sector? And how do we get them? And I think that some of it emerged is from the insurance sector, you know, because what happened was all of a sudden you have these, insur- you know, these right. climate events and these environmental catastrophes, even going back to Superfund, you know, if you have these terrible environmental catastrophes, look what just happened in, look what just happened in Ohio. I mean, yeah, you have now burned this dioxin. Now that's out in the air. I mean, you may need to literally shut that down and and cut cap it off. I I don't know what the ultimate result of that is going to be because it's pretty dangerous and very toxic. Yes. And and really look at all the cancer we have all over the world in this country. That's from toxicity. I mean, it's not rocket science, you know, it's it's toxicity in the body, in the system, in the environment, in our foods, in our in our surroundings. And I mean, off gassing of everything. I mean, the things we buy, the things we surround ourselves, the paint on our walls, everything is toxic foam inside the foam inside our couches. In, I mean, all of it can be toxic and yeah. and we shouldn't be surprised when our bodies respond to that because it's not a natural normal thing just like nature knows but i just wanted to end in that thought process by saying that i think 
we, you know, really got started to get the insurance sector involved because they were having to put out a lot of money when there was a drought and a fire and a flood. And it's like, and they're going, whoa, whoa. We, we only, did, we only had did. one hurricane in 1974, but last year we had 10, you know, and now we have this many earthquakes. And, and so suddenly all this money, and then you have, the financial sector going, whoa, we better like get involved in this because now insurance is getting higher. Now it's right. where, where should we be citing ourselves? Where should we be? Where are the highest risks? What are the highest risks as it relates to people as well? Yeah. I mean, if you've got slave labor and suddenly that comes out in our brand, think about the hit to our brand on that. Right. When, I spent time at Mattel and I remembered when they found the lead paint in the toy train. I mean, it, you know, you had the whole C-suite involved. You had, you know, the market hit, hit us. Our stock price went down. People stopped buying, you know, I mean, so this is, these are real hits if we don't pay attention to this. And I think right. finally what ESG really represents is that financial sector, that insurance sector, mm. that investment sector, mm. Wall Street, not just Main Street, finally getting involved. Yeah. And, and I think those are the people that we really, those are the sectors that we need to push things forward because um, activism, yeah, activism pushes things, advocacy is important, but if those sectors aren't involved to actually invest, create the investment in the first place, we, we wouldn't be able to push our agenda forward as much as we can. Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. I, and our agenda is really important. Yeah. You know, I heard this. Um, I heard this term the other day that I really liked. It's it's from um, he's a psychologist, I think, from UCLA, David okay. Siegel, and he's written this book called Intraconnected instead of Interconnected. And the intra was like you know that you feel it inside and you also feel it outside and. I think that for, for those of us who are and feel so connected to nature and that came from that place where it was our comfort space, yeah. you know, or we go out and we see so much wonder and awe when you look at nature and, and we, and it makes us feel connected. And, but it's also, we're connected as people too. Like when you and I, I mean, we, like, we know we feel best when we, when yeah. we're, Around people, you can't be isolated for so long. That we feel loved by, that we feel connected to, and 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 there's that, and there's that with nature, and and when when we're in that place where it's just like we're, we're interconnected to everything, and he, and it's a beautiful word. And then he came up with another word, which actually was pushed by a student of his. When I heard the story, I loved it. Oh. it that from an indigenous tribe that said. What do you think it is? He goes, well, it's me. It's it's not like individualism versus collectivism. It's both, right? It's me and we. It's me and you and we. And and she said, well, that's kind of you know clunky. Like, is there a better word? And he 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 kept trying to find a word, and he finally came up with the word we. We we we. That's cool. And. <laughs> And I was like, and, and I thought, see that, and and I bet you, I bet you, Tosin, that if you and I look that up for indigenous tribes in it South mean America, something. there'd be a word, there'd yeah. be a word for that connectedness, there'd be a yeah. concept, because they know no different, and, and that is their the reality, and yeah. we need to start listening to that reality, because yeah. that is wisdom you know that is that is the wisdom that this world needs right now in a yeah. big big way mm, yes we thank you i <laughs> we can't go on and on with this conversation <laughs> so but just a round up i um uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your phd your thesis what you're doing currently sure um and and also, you know, that I'm I'm working, it's interesting where I'm working. I'm working at the port of Long Beach. I work yes. Oh my, and we never got to talk yeah. about it. I was it's going to ask much. about those robots and when yeah. am I going to get my thoughts? No, and I want to encourage people to get online, even on YouTube. You could look yeah. up 
see, I recently created just a short little video that's only like a, a minute or two. Okay, and we'll have the link to the description for this video. Yes, that would be great. And um, because that link just shows that I'm actually working at the greenest terminal in the world. And it's because we have electrified all of the cranes, all of the equipment, and it's fascinating. It's like a big Lego land and I love it. And because um, it, it just is a, it is an environment where we dem have demonstrated we've grown from 700,000 containers to 3.3 million. And we've done that with metric tons of emissions going extraordinarily deep cut in all of our emissions and we're about to take on a project here in the next one or two years that'll that'll eliminate 93 percent of the remaining diesel emissions and we're and we're committed to be the first true net zero scope one and two you know facility in the mm. world um of its type so that's been exciting to be a part of and yeah and it's put and to be honest i say that because it's put my PhD on a little bit of a hold because okay. I I threw myself so into it, but it's far I, good. It's definitely yeah, great. But I started well, and I started my PhD in 2018. You know, I did the master's in learning technologies, um, and that was how learning technologies can accelerate sustainability and advance human rights. Yeah. And that was in 2015 and 2016. I took off 2017. I went for my PhD in global leadership and change. In 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And I took, I did nine credits a semester all through that time. And by the way, I got a four point every semester for, wow. <laughs> great, I always got a 4.0 right through my master's and PhD for all my classes. I'm a perfectionist. Pretty students. <laughs> and, and also, I remembered walking down the hall with my professor at one point and he's like, Bonnie, you know, I'm in this really difficult statistics, like, um, a multivariate analysis for, you know, I mean, it was really advanced multivariate analysis. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm struggling so bad. And he's like, you really only have to do this. You don't have to go all that. And I just looked at him and I said, do I look like a box checker to you? I said, I'm paying, I'm like, in, you know, I'm a pretty yeah, much yeah, really the oldest person in the class. I'm paying a lot of money for this. I'm not a box checker. I want to learn it. Right. <laughs> so I got to be, um, you know, it, it's just been a lot of fun. And I, I love that learning. And so what happened was then I decided my my thesis is really on modern slavery in complex supply chains. And my mm -hmm. focus, I'm trying to put my focus on like four commodities, cotton, cobalt, chocolate, and coffee. Mm -hmm. And because it's at the first mile that we really do see modern slavery, child labor, slaves that are working for nothing mm. and, or very little and really being exploited and really, you know, their environments are being degraded and their um, bodies are being hurt. And by, by providing us these things we all enjoy every day and people eat chocolate and and I've yet to coffee see, every day. Every day. And and I and honestly, I really feel and we are on our phones every day with the cobalt. Right. And, and we're wearing the cotton clothes. And you know, and it's just and yet we don't see that I've yet to see a find a supply chain that's clean. I've yet to find a supply chain that doesn't have environmental pollution and exploitation of people. Well, uh, I don't care what it is. It's fishing. It's tuna fish. And it's fish in Thailand where there's 130,000 vessels and 50,000 have slave labor on them. You know, it's mica that's in our makeup and in our car paint and in our, mm -hmm. our appliance paint. And it's, and it's in, and it's in India where children and, and women are, are slaving over this. And, and so it's really just, not okay for us to not be aware of this and to wake up and see that these people too need to participate these people too need to get a better life these people too right. need to be safer and they need to have shelter and have food and right. you know that a person if they mine cobalt their whole lives they need to own a cell phone you know be able to own a cell phone and and so it's just really, that's my goal is to, 
is to wake people up and bring transparency to that. And so yeah. that's my PhD. And I, um, I, I believe that, um, you know, I, I enjoy working with students and helping them see these things. I, I mean, half the time they, they look and they think, how do you stay so happy and, and energetic when <laughs> despite so all these hard. things that you see? Yeah. yeah. And I, my response to that is, you know, again, I'm, I remain, I'm a stubborn optimist and I remain hopeful. And I do think that when we, when we make things transparent and we, um, and we see things that we will take action. Yeah. What's necessary now is not just awareness, action. Action. Yeah. That's, I think that's the stage where we're at right now. It's creative. I always, when I'm thinking about telling people about an issue, I'm also trying to think of what action they should take. And my big goal is really like providing the resources. Oftentimes, like you hear about these problems and you get over the first thing is to get overwhelmed. Like, and so people will shut down just because of that. So it's finding the way to pull them out of that frustrated trauma that they go through. <laughs> And then help them to process how to, you know, make the change. Um, and you're just a roundup. I remember one of the, um, you, you made a quote at one of the dinners we had with Graham, uh, which was that, um, uh, a child in, I can't remember the country you mentioned, um, she didn't have to suffer because of someone who wants a couch in Minnesota or something. Yeah. That was sort of how you said it. That really, <laughs> you know, yeah, that, that's, that stayed with me after. Um, that night because truly we with every product we're creating we should think about again it's yeah what exactly who exactly is making these things I always for me was I started with fashion and then I realized because I also made clothes myself and I knew how long it took me to make them and so I could imagine how a child or a woman who just sits on a sewing machine hours and hours 18 20 hours a day and doesn't even sleep and 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 to feed their children and i think about that for us to think also of the the root causes of some of these problems of course is poverty and there's right. like in in non no access to education and and really without safety and shelter and food you know, you can't even think about the education. And so we have yeah. to get to a place where we recognize that, you know, I, I, this whole thing that we have going on right now with migration and immigration and migrants and, and people is pushing away, you know, and saying, we can't take them. We don't want them. They, you know, they're, they're illegally coming across. It's like, think about that mother that first of all she lived in Nicaragua or Honduras and she grew the produce that we've been eating in the winter we shouldn't be eating peaches and and some of these things in the winter but we're getting right. on those lands but now because of climate change there's such a drought. they're also disproportionately affected fruit she can't grow that food anymore and so she has three children and they're starving and she's going to risk her life to come over this border. She's potentially going to get raped. She's going to get robbed. She's going to come here illegally to be a maid to somebody so she can feed her children back home. Like how do we turn that away? And how do we not see that that's how we came to these countries and, and that these people should be given a chance. And more importantly, how do we forget that, if these people don't come and we don't take the time to train them and upskill them and, and invite them and, and that we won't have social security because we won't, yeah. have, we won't even be able to pay for ourselves, you know, as we get older, because there's nobody working into the system. So invite these migrants and train them and, and be part and let them be part of our system and pay taxes and do, you know, but we have to help and we have to serve and we have to be open hearted. And I don't know whether, we, like I, I say we have to, but it's like, I, I'm imploring everybody to just think with open minds and open yeah. eyes and open hearts and, 
like move up from our heads to our hearts, to our hands, you know, and take action because the time is now. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yes. Well, that's mic drop. We'll head with that. <laughs> mic drop. Boom. <laughs> The time is now. <laughs> the time is now and the future is now. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it this time. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Tosin. And, and, Same too. And, I'm, and I hope that your audience um, enjoys. And, and certainly I'm all over LinkedIn and, and, and people are, I invite anybody to reach out because um, I'm invested in, in regeneration, next generation. Yes. In the future, yeah. and I will, I will always make myself available. Definitely, and yes, I can attest to that. But it's awesome. <laughs> um, and I will add um, the the Long Beach uh, Container Terminal video in the um, video description, and also the links to your LinkedIn um, mm-hmm. and your profile as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and Thank anybody wants much. to take my course, I'm, I'm <laughs> starting in April um, at UCLA at the Extension. Right. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to the Sustainability Nuggets podcast. I am Rarsu Maribi. And I am Tosin Falaransho. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a rating and review on wherever you listen to your podcast. You can also show your support by signing up for a small donation to help sustain future episodes. You can find all relevant links in the description. See you in our next episode.